Hello. That's me, M.K. Davis, uh, standing beside a giant blow-up of Patty's head. Uh, you know, uh, back in the day when I used to get a lot of arguments about the quality of the film, and I decided uh, that if I could blow it up that big and you could still see what it is, then it should end the argument about how good the film is. And I, and I think that it did. Uh, what you see here is a picture that's on um, an internet site, and it's got a listing of the top 100 people in the Bigfoot world, and and it has a less than flattering thing to say about me. Uh, let me read it to you. Number 82, uh, Marlon K. Davis occupies a spot on both lists, both helping to prove the authenticity of the PG film and then started seeing things in the video that weren't there eventually refuting his own good work. Well, I, I guess I do have this bad habit of uh, uh, asking questions. And uh, if, I, if something doesn't, you know, jibe, then I, I look into the matter. And, uh, you know, I guess that can get you in trouble sometimes. It may get you not way down on the list. Hey, uh, here's me uh, back last June, um, headed into the Bluff Creek area, just uh, hoofing it, walking. Uh, the gates were locked, and we just went under the gates and decided to mosey on into that area and take a look around for ourselves. I guess, you know, that's just me uh, just uh, snooping around back there and uh, trying to get some things and questions answered, uh, you know, uh, and the kind of thing that gets you in trouble, gets you knocked down way down to number 82 on the list or lower. Well, you know, look at this. Uh, I, I guess I got to paying too much attention to my shadow and, it kind of rung a bell with me uh, back to the Patterson film when I saw this frame and I could see how long that shadow was. And so I decided to put them together and just compare them. And hey, look, uh, about the same, really. I guess the point is that, I, you know, I've been an uh, amateur astronomer for a long time. And I know, you know, that in, in, in all the seasons you can have a long shadow depending on the time of day. But uh, you can't have a short shadow uh, unless it's the summertime. Uh, the sun has to be at a high angle to do that. You know, so I, I guess that's me seeing things. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. Take a look at this photo on the left there and look at the shadow right next to the patty there. Back in the backside, you can't hardly see anything there. But then look on the right side, and you'll see that there's a huge tree in there, and you can see all the bark patterns and all of that. That's just a little something I learned to do while I was an astronomer uh, before I got into the, this Bigfoot uh, field of pursuit. Uh, uh, subtracting subdued tones and brightening up a picture that's very, very dim. And I got kind of good at it there, and, and, you know, and a lot of things in the Patterson film, you know, can be brightened up using that method. And you can kind of see what's going on all around her in the background and things like that. And then I broadened out a little bit and started applying it to other films. And, and one that particularly interested me was his tracking doll videos because uh, I, I kind of halfway suspected that the two might be linked together, you know, due to the fact that it had this uh, paw print in the bottom of frame 352. Uh, and, and the paw print being reddish colored and, you know, uh, so the, the similarities of what you're looking at down there were too striking. So I had to do a little snooping. And, and so I, I went to where these gentlemen were kind of, uh, holed up on the side of a hill there and looking around and, uh, and they were kind of in the shadows. So I brightened them up a little bit and gosh, was I surprised. Let's take a look. I was trying to get an ID on these guys, you know, get a better look at them and see if I could figure out who they were. And, uh, you know, uh, when I took the, f the film apart and did a frame by frame and, and did uh, the, the sub subtraction of the subdued tones, uh, it brightened it up quite a bit. And then I could see, I could see that I recognized somebody in this film. Uh, somebody who's uh, kind of famous in the Bigfoot world. Uh, he's he's uh, been involved with uh, the things surrounding the Patterson film uh, and 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 other efforts uh, for quite a while there, and then he kind of disappeared from the scene for many years. But it's a gentleman by the name of uh, Jim McLaren, 
And understand now, he's not supposed to be on this film. He would probably deny it if you questioned him. But if it's not him, it's his twin. Uh, let's just take a look. There's a known photo of Jim McLaren on the left and compare it to the right after brightening up. You'll see that it's a, <laughs> a pretty good match. And notice that he's carrying a pouch under his left arm there. Uh, and Jim McLaren was known for carrying a uh, small 8mm film camera around with him everywhere he went. So, you know, there, there's the tracking dog video and there's Jim McLaren in it. And it's kind of interesting because, when you know, uh, people often are not whom, who they claim to be. And, and I don't mean identity-wise, but, I mean, uh, they, they sort of mislead you about what their reasons for being there are or the reasons for even being in the pursuit uh, and, and, and other things as well. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, take a look at this. Now, this is from an interview uh, uh, with... Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, done by uh, Ivan Sanderson in November of 1968 for Argosy Magazine. And in it, he mentions John Green and Rene DeHinden and their occupations. A and what he said about DeHinden's occupation really caught me by surprise because Mr. DeHinden always said that he was full-time Bigfooter and he only worked to gather lead at a skeet range and sell it to finance his Bigfooting. Uh, so when it, when when Mr. Sanderson said this, and he's a famous man, and he's not known for lying, this really caught my attention. Uh, let's read it. Now, in the yellow, these Canadians, Mr. John Green, a newspaper publisher of Harrison Lakes, British Columbia, and Rene de Hinden, originally a Swiss mountaineer, but for the past two decades, 20 years, that is, a government forestry officer for the Canadian government. Now, like I said, Mr. Mr. Uh, Sanderson was a well-known author and n known for getting his facts straight. So why would he say that Mr. DeHinden was an employee of the Canadian Forestry Service for 20 years? If this is true, then the only thing that Mr. DeHinden ever did was hunt Bigfoot there. And, and, and if you can imagine getting up, and putting your clothes on, grabbing your rifle, and going hunting Bigfoot, and being paid by the Canadian Forestry Service. Now, hmm. Well, maybe I'm just seeing things that aren't there. But still, you know, I'm still curious, and I'm still going to just look into it and dig some more. Uh, so Mr. DeHinden, uh, who says he was only a skeet shooter, uh, a lead reclaimer, uh, it ends up being a 20-year employee of the Canadian Forestry Service and then ends up owning a, a good portion of the rights to the famous Patterson film, which he only paid 10 U.S. dollars for. How do you pull that off? Well, now, here's a copy that where you can read it for yourself, you know, that this transaction occurred for 10, 10 U.S. dollars. So you, there, there's Mr. Uh, Gimlin, the guy who was there when the film was taken, goes to court, wins the rights to the film, and then sells them to Rene DeHinden, this Canadian Forestry Service employee, if that's correct, uh, for 10 U.S. dollars, which is like giving it away. And then he agrees to this. All right, you can read it there in yellow. And all lecture rights with respect to said footage, provided, however, that Gimlin may retain one copy of said footage for their personal use and enjoyment, which may be shown only privately to groups of less than 10 people and for no monetary or other compensation. So for $10, he gives up all of his rights to even talk about the film publicly. Now, you know, I'm sorry, but I've been around a while. Something else is going on here. Now, let's get back to Mr. McLaren and why I even brought him up at all. Uh, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, in a recent interview that Mr. McLaren did, uh, uh, he, he carved a famous wooden Bigfoot that ended up being world famous and it sits outside of the, the Bigfoot Museum there in Willow Creek. And uh, he was being interviewed about his carving of that statue. And he said a very curious thing. And, and let me read it to you. 
Now, now this interview was conducted by Miss Bobby Short, uh, and she runs a website called Bigfoot Encounters, and, and I got this off of her site. And uh, she uh, she interviewed Mister McLaren, and he made this statement. And let's read it. Let me read it to you. It says the exchange began easily. Enough, I thought. McLaren was quick to say that he launched the project in the summer of 67. No date, just summer was all he was willing to say, date-wise, but added, it was on the, added that it was on the same day that summer that Roger Patterson filmed the creature in Bluff Creek. Think about it. Think about it. The same day that summer that Roger Patterson filmed the creature at Bluff Creek. Well, supposed to have done it in October, uh, but that brought, you know, remember, remember the picture of me? Hold on. Remember this picture? I look at the shadow of myself on June the 10th at about 1130 in the morning and look there at the shadow. That's not an October the 20th shadow, friends. I mean, that kind of thing doesn't change. It's measurable. And people have looked at this that that are experts, and they say sometime within a few weeks of the summer solstice that this film was taken. Summer. Summer of 67 when Roger Patterson filmed the creature at Bluff Creek, according to Jim McLaren. Probably just a slip. But slips happen especially after 40 years plus. So let's like let's take a little look at it, McLaren in that track and dog video. Remember it was taken in the summer of 67. Uh, just take another look at it. Here's Mr. McLaren or his twin uh, with his little pouch and his 8 millimeter camera at Bluff Creek summer of 1967. And anybody ought to know it ought to be him and it was him that made the quote. Uh, Roger Patterson began, took his film in the summer of 67. And the shadows back that up. Now, uh, let's continue on. Now, now back to the, uh, the, the red paw print in the sand. Uh, let's take a look at that. And, and look, take a look at this picture right here with this dog. You notice that they're coming up out of the sandbar onto a road. Uh, you can see the edge of the road is hard packed right there. Uh, and, you know, that's really interesting to me. And this is why uh, Bob Gimlin told me that the only way you could get anything heavy like equipment in there was to fly it in with a helicopter and land it in there from the air. That the place was so remote that you couldn't get anything like that. The only way you could get in was horseback. And that's not what the film is showing. The tracking dog video shows something different, and not just the tracking dog video. Uh, first of all, uh, let's take a look at a document here in just a minute. Now, this is a transcript uh, from a radio interview that Bob Gimlin did in November the 5th of, I think, 2008. But at any rate, uh, this is what it says. And I suppose I hired a helicopter to come down with that backhoe to drop that backhoe in there and dig a hole to bury them, the carcasses in, didn't I? That's what they claimed. What he's referring to is the remoteness of the area uh, was such that he claimed that you would have to fly the equipment in, that you couldn't get it in otherwise. And, and when he first told me that, he told it to, to me personally, I knew better. I'd been down to that creek many times. I knew the history of the creek, had researched it thoroughly. And I knew, you know, that he wasn't being on the up and up with me. But uh, just for your benefit, let me just show you something. Here's Bob Gimlin on horseback on a road that you could probably drive a Cadillac down in the bed of Bluff Creek. They packed these roads hard and spread lime on them, and they hardened up like concrete. Uh, you know, and, and for him to say that you had to fly something in there, uh, well, look for yourself. So let's get back to the subject of this dog, this Alsatian dog with the full body harness on that's being handled by a trainer or a, or a handler. Uh, and is there any 
connection between that tracking dog video and the Patterson film, other than that bloody paw print, well, kind of. Let's, let's take a look. Let's read another transcript uh, that I quote from Bob Gimlin in this transcript from an interview he did. <clears throat> he said, Roger had called the track people who had track dogs up in Canada to come down there. And so I figured if they didn't have anything to check out and go by, there wasn't going to be any tracking at all. So that was my first response to that, the fact that something had to be uh, done, had to be, had to be able to be shown so that there's evidence there to get them dogs going or whatever they had to do because I didn't know anything about these track dogs. I didn't know who the guy was who had them, but he had Roger had told me that he was call, He called earlier that evening from Al's place. Al's store down there that this guy, I think the guy's name was McCulley or something like that. He explained to him, oh, oops. He explained to him that these dogs would track anything, anywhere, and said that they were a German Shepherd breed. And Bob went on to say, well, I never knew that much about German Shepherd dogs. See, I figured they had to be a bloodhound or sin hound of some type. But this gentleman had told Roger that these dogs would track anything, anywhere, as long as he put them on the scent. And so, therefore, I knew that I had to do something about these tracks or that what I figured, I didn't know much about track dogs or anything like that, but I also figured if they were going to have anything to go by, they got to see something. Well, this is what he's referred to by they got to see something. They got to take them to the place where they can pick up a scent in order to track it. You see that little red, watery little hole there and that black, lumpy, furry thing over there in the hole? Uh, that's what he's referring to. So they got to have something to, to go by. So you see it there in the tracking dog video exactly what he's referring to. Now, here's something very interesting right here. Uh, it's a series of photos from the tracking dog video that shows a pile of feces laying on the ground uh, that looks every bit and every much like horse turds. Uh, so, you know, you see the dog is interested in them. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Mr. Green said that these were rocks. They weren't. This is not a horse turd. It's a pile of rocks. Uh, I beg to differ with him on that. Uh, no, I know a horse turd when I see one, and and, and that's that's what you're looking at there. Uh, there's your horse with with Bob Gimlin riding him. Hmm. Now back to that hard packed road issue and the backhoe and whether you could ride a backhoe down there or not, or whether you had to fly it in. Well, Al Hodson, longtime resident of Will Willow Creek, uh, uh, consented to an interview uh, by me and Don Monroe in 2008, I believe it was, and uh, he was very kindly filled us in on the backhoe thing. And, and let's just listen to him and just pay particular attention to the fact that this backhoe was on site. Uh, let's listen. They commandeered Charlie Wilson's backhoe. Charlie Wilson. Whitson. Whitson. Yeah. Commandeered it now. That's I mean, right. Just well, I mean, crank it up and walk, drove off with it? Well, yeah. Well, they used it. Anyway, they uh, um, used that to uh, get their truck out of it. And so he, he asked me, he said, would you go down and, and, and uh, talk to Charlie and tell him that, that uh, I want to make it right? Uh, ask him how much he charged me and how much I would pay it. And so I went down and told Charlie. Charlie was mad. He was mad? <laughs> yeah. Well, I can understand why they did it. Well, he was mad because they used his back hole without permission. Yeah, well, I can understand. What was the guy going to do over there? Like, I, I'm probably done the same thing. Did he live close by Bluff Creek? No, he lived right down here. So he had to come all the way to town to get it? Well, no, the back hole was up there. Oh, it was up at Bluff Creek? Yeah, it was up there. It was on, on a job up there or something. Oh, okay. Okay. And so they, uh, Hmm, an excavated pit with red material in it. Hmm. And, and I'd like to say to all my viewers that are, have been following this, you know, on YouTube, um, that this, uh, there's, the film itself is rock solid. I mean, it is clearly a genuine, authentic film of an authentic, uh, if you want to call these Bigfoot or Sasquatch or whatever you want to call them. It's the story that has problems. 
and, and why you can't get this film in the in, uh, to be authenticated or, or get Bigfoot in the textbooks using this film is mainly not because of what's on the film, but because of the story. The story just does not jibe. Timelines for developing the film don't jibe. Uh, and it, some of the story is absolutely impossible. And then you get these contradictory things and unquestionable every, this and that. Uh, you know, so it, it's, it's don't, don't think that I'm, you know, out to get anybody or out to hurt anybody or anything like that. I just, it, it's, it, you have to question the story, the veracity of the story. Um, and and the, the film will stand on its own. Like the gentleman said on that website earlier, uh, am I seeing things that are not there? Or am I just somebody who uh, pays attention? I thank you for your time.